Hello and welcome to another episode of the Golden Hour Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Mays. This show is brought to you by the Polar Pro Studio. And instead of having a normal theme song today, I just thought I would play my guitar. love guitars. This is my Epiphone uh, Old Glory, is what it's called. The Jared James Nichols Edition. It's a Gibson Les Paul kind of body, but it's actually made by Epiphone. Made in China, so it's way cheaper. Um, I love this guitar. It's got a P90 pickup, if you know anything about that. A single pickup on the bottom. Uh, very simple, elegant, beautiful, thick, heavy, big chunky 50s neck on there. I love this thing. I love the tone. I love playing on it. And you may have seen it in some of my other uh, Golden Hour videos, which if you're an audio listener, we please head over to youtube.com slash ghpod. Uh, give us a little subscribe. Just a little like, a little tickle on that uh, on that like button there. And leave a, an old comment um, as you go along if you listen around uh, and you find something that you want to comment on. As you may notice, I am uh, here by myself today in the Golden Hour set. Um, this is the new Golden Hour podcast format. I know I've already said that twice, um, but this, I think, is the best option for all of us. And when I say all of us, I mean myself, Connor, and um, the occasional guest that I have. So... Basically, the show will function as such. I will begin each show with news and uh, interesting rumors, things that are happening in the industry, as well as any follow-up items that we've had uh, from previous episodes that need some sort of follow-up. Maybe somebody uh, reaches out and gives me a note on, on something that I reference or maybe I'm able to follow up on, on some news or, or gear-related things that I reviewed or things that Connor reviewed that he could fill me in on. Connor may join us um, again. You know, uh, To be honest, I think doing it like this is probably the best for both of us. He's working a lot now with Zach Mayfield and Gear Focus, the shirt that I'm wearing right now. Um, I hope to continue to work with Connor, and he will probably do the editing portion of this video and podcast still moving forward. But being able to record these at nighttime when my kids go to bed, when there's no noise, um, when I'm done working, when I'm able to do things, you know, off hours, um, uh, you know, I have a full time job now. I'm basically working from about 10 o'clock to 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock to 5 o'clock ish uh, every day. And from 5 to 8, you know, I want to be with my family. I want to be with my kids. That's precious time to me. Um, so that really only leaves, you know, 8 o'clock to midnight for me to shoot these things. And uh, it is obviously a challenge to line that up with, with a guest, to line that up with Connor. So like I said, we'll begin each show with news, rumors, and follow-up items. And then that will lead us to our main topic. Now, if I'm lucky and I, I'm able to line up an amazing guest, that would be the, the main topic, would be uh, whoever our lovely guest is that week. If we don't happen to have a guest that week, then I will choose a main topic that we could talk about. And you guys have been messaging me over the last couple months, uh, giving me some suggestions, you know, doing lighting tutorials or composition uh, explanations or doing breakdowns of other people's work. Uh, there's kind of an endless amount of topics that we could we could cover. I would love to have basically little mini reviews in the podcast. Um, so I, you know, as you've noticed, I haven't been super active on like actual YouTube for about six months ever since I left Indie Mogul, moved back here to Nashville. Um, this podcast has really been all that I've been doing on YouTube. So that would give me kind of an outlet to uh, review stuff. And uh, maybe that would be interesting to you guys. So instead of watching, you know, like a traditional review that is really focused on just YouTube uh, stuff, algorithm stuff, um, you could just do a simple, you know, review inside of the podcast, which we've done before. I've, I've talked about cameras and, you know, Zach talked about stuff. We had Jordan Drake on who shared his experience with the new 5D or G, GH5 Mark II. Um, 
and then we'll end it with an off topic uh conversation uh as you guys know i have many interests um you may notice if you're watching the video i've got my game boys here on the on the side here along with my ps1 um i've been going through a bit of a, a game boy uh resurgence this is actually my real uh game boy yellow uh game boy color it's all yellow um and i've got classic tetris in here and i have been currently super obsessed with classic tetris uh either on game boy or on nes and i, I want to share that with you guys today I'd love to include music as well. Maybe we can end each episode with a little guitar playing kind of, you know, reminiscent to uh, the WTF podcast. If you're a fan of that, I think he plays guitar at the end of almost every episode. So maybe I could uh, I could do a little, a little jam sesh at the end of every episode. Um, today's episode, our main topic is me. Um, I feel like you guys have heard so many interviews with so many different creators and a lot of you may have heard my story through, you know, multiple conversations that I've had. But this episode is going to be kind of a, a mini biography about uh, my journey on YouTube and my journey as a filmmaker. So let's get started with our rumors and uh, camera related news. I don't have a soundboard yet, so I'll just have to make my own. Oh, yeah. Let's talk rumors and gear stuff. First off, the new Sony ZV-E10 uh, leak. There's a bunch of images that leaked and I am honestly very excited for this camera um, because I feel like it fills a need in the market. Uh, for a long time, I would recommend the Canon M50 to people who just wanna get started. They just wanna enter into that YouTube, uh, you know, run and gun, quick, easy to shoot with camera. And the M50 really served that for a lot of people for a long time. And I honestly, still to this day, would, would say that it's a decent camera, especially for the price point. You can get them for like 400 bucks now. The Sony ZV-1, however, came out, uh, I guess, a little over a year ago now. And that camera was like a little point-and-shoot camera that had a small sensor, a one-inch sensor, but it's still bigger than, than your phone. Uh, it's still bigger than the most older point-and-shoot cameras. So you could get some bokeh. It's got a 1.8 lens on it. Um, but it had a flip screen. It had a great built-in mic. It also had a mic jack. Uh, great camera, but, you know, it's not interchangeable. So you kind of... And then the next step up would be like an A6400 or uh, A6600, which are much more expensive. They're bigger, bulkier, and they're designed for photography and, and uh, hybrid shooting and not so much for the YouTuber crowd. Um, this camera really seems to be an answer to what a lot of YouTubers have been dying for. This is really what I would have loved to have had when I started out. Um, this one camera can essentially do everything, it seems. It's got, again, the decent built-in mic, which you might not believe it, but the, having a decent built-in mic is a pretty big deal. Uh, David Dobrik and many other YouTubers don't even use mics on the camera. I know, it's shocking. It's crazy. How could that be? How could that be? Uh, but the truth is, is that um, having kind of, uh, this is going to sound weird, but having things that look and sound a little amateur on YouTube play really well, um, especially on social, social media, uh, platforms, having things that have kind of a little bit rough and dirty kind of amateurish feel to it. It just feels more relatable for some reason. I think it has to do a lot with the immaturity of the platform. I think a lot of us forget that YouTube is still so young and has, you know, I mean, we're all uh, the biggest YouTubers, the people that have been on it for years, you know, if they started out when they're teenagers, they're still in their thirties. Like it, it's not a thing that has really matured. Um, I can't imagine what, you know, it's going to be in another 20, 30 years from now. Um, that being said, uh, having a camera with decent inbuilt audio is great because that means that you don't have to throw a mic on it. It's just one less thing that you have to bring, one less thing that could break, one less thing that gets in the way uh, when you're just trying to capture something in the moment, which also makes this a great little uh, camera to carry around with you. If you're just wanting to document your kids, take pictures of, of life, um, this could be great for that. 
Uh, it's a APS-C sensor, so it's a bigger sensor than the one-inch um, ZV-1 camera, but it shares basically the same form factor as the ZV-1, so it's very compact, extremely small, smaller than the A6400, and it's coming with that terrible, <laughs> uh, what is it? 16 to 50, uh, 3.5 to 5.6 lens from Sony. Um, this lens has been around forever. Uh, how many of you guys have used this lens? I mean, pretty much everybody that I know, they got like an A6300 to use this lens because it came with it. Uh, it's a crappy lens. The optics are bad, but it's small. And one thing that's really cool is that it has a power zoom. So it looks like the little uh, dial on the hand grip gives you a wide and tight so you can zoom in and out with it. Big old chunky record button. Uh, it'll probably light up, give you a tally light like the other one did. Uh, the ZV-1 has a little tally light. So when you're recording, you know you're recording. Another great feature. Flip screen, of course the autofocus will be nuts. Doesn't look weatherproof. Um, it's got a mic jack, it's got a flip screen. It's got everything that you would want if you're a YouTuber. So. I'm curious to know if it has built-in ND, because the ZV-1 did have a built-in ND. Um, this probably won't, but it would be cool if it did. Um, so yeah, ZV-E10, be on the lookout for it. We don't know exactly when it's coming out. Um, it may be coming soon, because this rumor was back about a little over a week ago. So, pretty exciting. Moving on to uh, another leak that, that I found on fourthirdsrumors.com. It's a video from a guy who's from Japan. Uh, or well, he's living in Japan. Um, his YouTube channel is called Film Studio Taku High. I'll link it in the description. And I'm not going to really watch this video for long because this guy really rambles like crazy. Uh, Windows 10 man, <laughs> if you're watching the video, he's got a giant screen next to him that's just like rotating Windows 10. Um, anyways, yeah, let's watch this just for a second and then I'll kind of summarize what he's saying. But basically for a very long time, people have been dying to have phase detect autofocus in the Panasonic cameras. If you're not familiar with, with what that is, you may be familiar with kind of the sentiment that people hate the autofocus in Panasonic cameras. Um, that's a bit of a blanket statement. Uh, there are people who do like it, um, mainly photographers. If you're a photographer, the contrast-based DFD autofocus that they have isn't bad. It, it does work very well. Um, it doesn't track very well. I've had problems tracking my kids when they're walking around and moving around like crazy. Um, Panasonic, for some reason, like has kind of spewed this information out there that like having phase detect which is what sony has it's it's a similar version to what dual pixel autofocus is on canon cameras is what fuji's using it's even what olympus is using and that's a, a micro four thirds sensor camera that type of autofocus works beautifully as you know canon and sony especially have amazing autofocus i never have to think about it i'm using a canon camera right, right now and I don't even have to worry about it. I can see that there's a box around my, my mustached face, which by the way, yes, audio listeners, I have shaved my face. If you're watching the video, you would know by now. Um, I may keep it for a while. I'm starting to like it. I thought it was a little goofy at first. Um, I've done it before. Uh, my wife actually surprisingly loves it. So, um, you know, happy wife, happy life. Am I right? Uh, so yeah, I think, it, you know, it's a distinct look. It's an interesting look. Um, but yeah, Panasonic for years has said that including phase detect would degrade the image on their cameras. Um, where are they getting this information? Like uh, technically, scientifically, um, yes, you, they're correct. It does technically degrade the image, but that is a compromise that we're willing to take with having good autofocus. Like, um, I don't know. I think they were just hoping that their technology would advance further than it did. Um, because clearly, you know, Sony A1 is the top of the line flagship six, seven thousand dollar camera, and it has phase detect on it, and the images look great. You know, the Canon R5, it's a beautiful camera, very expensive, very successful camera company selling a lot of cameras, making very beautiful images with a version of phase detect. So obviously, I, I feel like that's just not an excuse anymore. And this guy from Japan, who seems to have some insider knowledge for some reason, he's being very vague and very kind of like 
fishy about it all. Um, but let's take a look here. We've been waiting for this. I would say jump on the GH6. Um, I would say, sorry, Panasonic, but I would say to anyone that isn't relying on manual focus, probably wait for the GH6 over the GH5 Mark II because we really need to send a loud, clear message that the phase detect is what's been holding us back. Uh, you know, I used to be a Panasonic owner and I... Yeah, so he's, I kind of cut in the middle here. I'm also watching at 1.5x speed on YouTube because this guy talks very slow. Um, but he's basically saying like, if you're a Panasonic fan and you've been waiting, like this is it, um, you know. It went away from Panasonic, primarily for autofocus reasons. And I've been wanting to go back for a long time and haven't primarily for autofocus reasons. Phase detect is coming. So the GH6 uh, is definitely going to be worth the wait for anyone that feels the autofocus is the only thing keeping them away from it. Okay, so sorry for making you watch that. <laughs> it was very slow and I don't really know what he's saying here. Who is this guy? He's, you know, he's got Windows 10 floating around on his monitor uh he may or may not be trustworthy um if it's true though man that'd be awesome because to be to be honest the panasonic cameras are pretty much perfect in every way for video shooters um it'd be nice if they had built-in nd uh but other than that other than the autofocus and i guess built-in nd if we're being picky but i mean that's something that you only get on uh actual cinema cameras anyways uh, I mean, the A7S III doesn't have that, so, you know, just to be fair, let's exclude that from the conversation. But let's just say that the Panasonic S5, which already exists, it, it already exists, it's a full-frame camera um, from from Panasonic. It can shoot really great 4K, it can do RAW. Um, if that camera had really good autofocus, if it had phase detect autofocus on the sensor, that would be like... I feel like that would be selling like crazy. It'd be selling more than the A7S III, potentially. It would definitely completely uh, like take over. Remember how the GH5 took over when that thing came out? If you're a video shooter, you remember when the GH5 came out. Uh, so many people switched over to that camera. Um, or if they already had a GH4, it was just a logical upgrade and, and a wonderful upgrade with the IBIS with the great 4K, the slow motion, 4K 60. That was a big deal at the time. Like most cameras didn't have that. Um, and it still is. I mean, it still is a wonderful camera, but the autofocus sucks. But autofocus didn't really matter until the GH5 came out, which is basically right when uh, Casey and Istat started doing vlogging and all these filmmakers started thinking they could do it too. Uh, myself included, but... <laughs> um, you know, I think at a time, even Casey was using the Panasonic camera. Uh, I was at NAB that, that week when he switched to the Panasonic uh, GH5 for his vlogs, and they said that sales went up like 25% that day or, you know, that week uh, on Amazon, which is crazy. They'd never seen a spike that, that crazy before. So anyways, um, this guy seems extremely fishy and uh, non-trustworthy. Um, so, uh, please take this with a grain of salt, but let's just kind of imagine for a second what the GH6 could be with phase detect, uh, amazing IBIS, best in class IBIS, the, the stabilization on sensor, if you're not familiar with IBIS is in body image stabilization. It's wonderful. It works so good. Um, that w would blow, you know, Sony out of the water, even though they have good IBIS now, their, their stabilization is good. Uh, it's still not as good as the GH5, so that would be wonderful in the GH6. Um, this guy also goes on to say that it potentially might have more resolution than just 6K. It might go up to 7K. I don't know. This guy might just be trying to pull our leg, trying to grow his subscribers. He's only got 70 subscribers, so maybe he's just trying to grow an audience. Um, I don't know, but he sure is acting as though he knows something from Japan just being there. He knows somebody that knows somebody. I don't know. And that stuff does happen. The truth is, is I know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody too. And I've been told that it won't have phase detect autofocus uh, from the camera fairies or whatever. So, um, yeah, I don't know. 
I don't I don't know. I don't believe him really. It's it's about 50-50. I don't know. Let me what what do you guys think? I don't know. Let me know. Canon C70. It's what I'm using right now to film this video with. Um it has some amazing features, but one of the things that really stood out to me that kind of sucked about it was the autofocus. It wasn't as good as like their hi hybrid cameras, which was kind of weird cuz um it's the same company. <laughs> so, uh, it's like, do you guys talk to each other? You know, the photo guys and the video guys, I guess not. Um, yeah, like the R5, R6 ha had better autofocus, uh, UI and like support than the C70 did. Um, until now, basically the autofocus is fixed. There's a great firmware that just came out. Um, I forget which version number it is. Um, but basically it, it completely fixes my issues with it. It's much faster, more reliable. And the lens that I use most, the 24-105, to 105, which is on the camera right now, that wasn't supported previously, but now it is. So if you're a Canon C70 user, uh, definitely update your firmware because this is a, a pretty big one. Uh, version 1.0.1.1. So it uh, came out at the end of June. And if you're in the market for kind of a mid-range cinema camera and that $5,000 price point, uh, and you're looking at the FX6 or the FX3 uh, from Sony or the C70, um, I will go ahead and put my like hand in the air and you know my name in the cap or of whatever and recommend this. And I, I like the C70. I really do. I've been using it almost on a daily basis now for the last six months with my new job, um, and then obviously this podcast, and it's been just a wonderful workhorse. It's the perfect size for me. It can fit in my smaller camera backpack. Um, the autofocus does work really well. Color science is wonderful. Um, you can't go wrong with any of anything these days. Pretty much everything's great, um, but I will go ahead and just vouch and say... If you're on the fence with the C70, I love it. I think it's great. Rent it. Do a shoot with it. Um, you know, there's a couple quirks with it. You definitely don't want to use uh, RF lenses because you're not getting their full potential. So, unfortunately, you're kind of stuck with the older EF lenses. Uh, the Sigma 18-35 to is great, but the autofocus isn't very good on it. So, I would stick to EF if you can. I do love the 24 to 105 on the turbo booster, uh, but it's still not like completely enough bokeh for, for most scenarios. So uh, if you can at least get a 2.8 lens or, or below, obviously, then you can get some more bokeh. But, you know, in this situation, I'm shooting on F4, and uh, which is 2.8 technically with the turbo booster, but that's just telling you what it would be on a Super 35 but it's still four. It still is four on full frame. Um, so <clears throat> I won't get into that. But and that's so that's it for our first segment. <laughs> on to our main segment for today. First off, if you've made it this far and you're not a subscriber, uh, and if you are watching the podcast uh, on YouTube, would you please leave a comment, leave a, leave a like, and subscribe if you haven't. I know it's annoying to hear all your favorite YouTubers ask you to do that, but it truly does make a difference. Uh, we're trying to get to at least a thousand so we could get monetized and kind of, you know, get legitimized, if you will. So uh, we are trying to hit a thousand uh, on this podcast. So please um, subscribe if you're a fan, and I'd really appreciate it. So I've done, how many of these? 122, 123 of these podcasts now. Um, interviewed a lot of people, and I've learned so much. And um, I kind of want to share some of my story with you guys. Um, a lot of people have asked about, you know, where I come from, and, you know, asked about the magic stuff, and the wedding stuff, and... Um, just my filmmaker journey, my YouTuber journey, and maybe my story can actually help you if, if you're going through some of the things that I went through. Um, I'm th about to turn 31. Uh, my birthday is in August. And uh, I started professional video when I was 17. So it has been a long time to be doing video professionally. Uh, 
it's kind of crazy actually when you think about it. So, um, I started when I was 17 years old shooting weddings and, um, but to go back a little further from that, I'll start with kind of my first job. Um, obviously you heard my interview with my dad. It, well, I, I don't want to assume that you've heard it, uh, but if you would like to hear it, um, it was two episodes ago on this show. I interviewed my dad and you you can hear his story, which is kind of interesting how similar our stories were. But um, anyways, he's a creative, he's a, a music producer and now a, a film director. And so I grew up around a, a creative dad and a dad who was always home too. He worked from home. He was always either producing music or, or selling, uh, he's, he would sell binders and sell different things on the side to like pay the bills. Um, and then he started doing, you know, the music stuff, the, the, uh, the, the worship jams and, uh, the jingles. And, uh, when I moved out, you know, over the last 15 years now or whatever, um, uh, he's he's been doing films of the last 10 years i guess but anyways uh so i've i've always been around that and when i was 14 years old i picked up magic and just started like getting really into it and i'm talking about the art of illusion i didn't go to hogwarts people so yeah i started doing magic when i was 14 i, I would work at different restaurants and uh do different shows for for kids for corporate events um there was a magic shop by my house, and I was mentored by a couple people. Uh, Stephen Bargatze, in particular, uh, he's actually Nate Bargatze's dad. If you've been on Netflix and you've ever been suggested to watch Nate Bargatze uh, comedy special, he's actually a really successful and hilarious comedian. Uh, they're from this area. They're from where I'm from here in Old Hickory. I'm not in Old Hickory now, but um, that's where I grew up. And his dad, Stephen Bargatze, is a kind of a world-renowned comedy uh, magician. And so he really influenced me. And I always felt like with my magic, I loved being silly and being funny and, and kind of infusing comedy with uh, with the tricks. I never took myself seriously. Um, I think it's ridiculous to take yourself seriously when you're doing magic tricks. You know, David Copperfield, Chris Angel, uh, even David Blaine. I feel like they go, they get so serious about it. You, you know, it's it's funny to me. I, I think magic can be funny. Um, David Blaine kind of rides the line. He can, he can be funny sometimes. I love David Blaine. He's probably my favorite one of, of all the people I listed. But anyways, um, I'll show you a clip here of kind of, I'll, I have to mute it because this was my little trailer for my magic stuff. Um, this I have to mute it because I have a Switchfoot song on there that tells you how old it is. Um, you can see a video of me drawing a ball, uh, a bowling ball on a pad of paper, a giant kind of drawing pad, uh, something that you would use if you were in an art school uh, and you're drawing a naked person. You know what I mean? You're, you're doing an art trace or something. And then in this case, I drew a bunch of tennis balls, tennis balls came out. And in this case, a bowling ball falls out of the paper. Pretty cool. That's a cool trick. Um, you may have seen other magicians do it as well. I've made that trick, but it's based on another one. But you can kind of just see me. This was this was a promo I used to book shows for church camps and youth groups. I was trying to get into that market, be kind of a Jonas brother for youth groups, if you know what I mean. <laughs> People used to call me a, a, a Jonas brother. Um, apparently I looked like one. I don't know. I don't see the resemblance. Um, but I had a ton of fun, uh, with that. That was kind of my, that was everything for me. Those like six years being a full-time illusionist. Um, you know, high school, obviously I wasn't full-time, but that was my only job when I was in high school. I worked at CC's pizza every Friday night and I would do magic there. And, uh, you know, I'd work for tips there and then I'd get free pizza. It was a pretty sweet setup. And then that eventually turned into working with a couple other uh, restaurants in town and, you know, people would book me for birthday parties and stuff. And then as I got older, when I went into college age, I did go to college for about a year and a half, but I, I dropped out. I didn't, I didn't really, uh, like college didn't really drive with me. Um, but while I was in that stage as well, I was pursuing uh, magic as a profession, and uh, you know that's why I made this little promo video here of some of my stage performances. And uh, a good friend of mine, Brock Gill, 
um, is another just world renowned magician. Uh, he perform. He used to perform at the time like 200, 300 times a year, uh, performing just for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people a year. Crazy stuff. Um, he really took me under his wing, and I, I got to go on the road with him. I got to ride, you know, tour buses and all that kind of stuff, and uh, would open up for him occasionally. Uh, did the, I mean, you know, a handful of times with that, but he did train me and, and taught me so much, mentored me. We'd go over to his house. He lives here in Nashville as well, but we, I say we, myself and another guy named Sean Emery, uh, we were good friends. We would hang out with him and, uh, he would just teach us stuff and teach us how to perform, how to own the stage, um, and how to infuse comedy and, and, you know, we were doing gospel centric stuff. So he was teaching us how to do that. And I was also doing wedding stuff at the same time. I was shooting weddings uh, to pay the bills uh, with my good friend Jeffrey Holland, who started a company called Full Frame Cinema. And that was right when the 5D2 came out in 2008-ish. Um, and we were shooting on DSLRs and you know shooting weddings, and that was very successful because we were some of the only people in the whole city that were shooting on DSLRs. Everybody else was shooting on camcorders. So our footage just looked so much better and we really got a, a leg up with that and, you know, got featured on Pinterest a couple times and um, got some cool ce- random celebrity weddings as well that, that kind of launched that business. And I was also doing video for Brock, you know, even though he was mentoring me as a magician, I would, of course, you know, bring my 7D at the time and we'd film stuff and I'd make like little promo videos for him and stuff. And um, yeah, so I was kind of doing a little bit of both and I met with a manager who was considering, uh, you know, signing me and basically helping me book shows and, and do like actual stage, uh, magic stuff. And as that process was going, um, Brock kind of sat me down before I like signed any contracts and stuff. And Brock told me like, Hey, magic is great. If you want to do that. And video is great. If you want to do that, you'll probably make more video and have maybe a little bit more success if, if you, uh, if you do video, you, you might make more money. Um, and then, you know, magic, it doesn't pay well and it's kind of a lonely on the road kind of job. So he was like, you're never going to be great at anything unless you focus on one thing. And so, and he said, and I recommend you, you do video over magic. So this is my, like, kind of my guy that I really look up to my mentor, um, a guy that was doing what I wanted to do with magic. And, uh, I took his advice and I basically just on the spot, just canceled magic. (laughs) I had a couple of shows booked, I think like two months out and, uh, I canceled those shows, gave them to some of my friends and, um, just pretty much stopped magic like cold Turkey and went full into video. And it was totally the right move. And I actually found out that I loved video way more than, than magic. Um, because I loved, I love magic because I love surprising people. I love seeing the reaction on people. When you're a magician, you really are in control of people's emotions. You're in control of their reaction. Um, Because I may be doing something with my hands, uh, and you may be thinking one thing, but I know what's about to happen. I'm controlling the whole situation. Even though you may think I made a mistake there, it's actually not. I'm trying to trick you to think that I made a mistake so that I can then hit you with the, you know what I'm saying? Um, and I found that you could do that with video. You could do that with storytelling. You can really have fun with, with, you know, twists and turns with storytelling and playing with people's emotions in a way. Um, and yeah, I ended up getting a staff pick, um, on Vimeo, which was a big deal at the time. It's probably not that big of a deal anymore. Um, but this was a film about my great uncle, Bobby. Um, I'll go ahead and play it, but you can see, yeah, it was a staff pick um, because um, Philip Bloom shared it on Twitter. Uh, this was eight years ago. Man, long time ago. This was shot on the 7D. This is my great uncle, Bobby, who's still alive and is still uh, an amazing man. Uh, lives in California. Uh, I just kind of told his story, made a little mini doc about it. And uh, it was, you know, he's an interesting, eccentric guy. And... Uh, the staff pick really changed my entire career. Uh, it allowed me to meet with other filmmakers. It gave me the opportunity to uh, 
pitch um like google reached out um to me to direct uh some big commercials for Google because they were referencing this video uh, as like, hey, we want our video to look like this. And so, hey, why don't we just hire the director that made that? Little did they know I was like super young, you know, I was young and had no experience. Um, But it became, you know, it gave me a lot of confidence. The fact that they gave me a shot, I I made a treatment and everything and um, I didn't get the job, but it was still a very confidence boosting moment. Um, and from that, I started directing, um, music videos and, and short films and different things here in town in Nashville, working with, um, a good friend, Seth Worley, um, who works with Red Giant, did a couple commercials, some really cool, uh, music videos over the years. Um, this video by Flurry, um, I shot and edited this entire, uh, video, uh, this was five years ago shot it in my apartment with a green screen and I edited the whole thing on my MacBook Air. If you're watching the video, you can see the visuals on it. It's really trippy kind of VHS 3D animation stuff and uh, a lot of green screen stuff. It was a ton of fun to make and I just loved kind of just doing whatever. And it was a, a really, doing these types of music video videos was creatively fulfilling for me. Uh, I found it to be way more fulfilling than doing the, uh, the wedding videos, uh, which I shot, I think at least over 300 wedding videos in my career. Um, and you know, this was the stuff I wanted to do. This is what I would show people on my website. I wouldn't post any of the weddings on my website or my Vimeo page at the time. Here's another music video I did six years ago with a friend named uh, Dalton Deal. This was the very first time I ever experimented with uh, 3D technology or 3D uh, animation. We kind of went for like a Guardians of the Galaxy kind of aesthetic. It was right when that movie came out. So I have a crazy guy with a bird head. Uh, little aliens take over the, the, the planet. He's like rocket boosters on his shoes. And then he jumps, he goes up into outer space. As I watch this back now, it's very cringy, very bad uh, animation, but it it was cool. It was very cool to make it. I had a lot of fun editing this stuff and making it. Um, Yeah, there he is. He looks a lot like the Guardians of the Galaxy guy, right? Yeah. So... Um, then I worked for Dave Ramsey, um, for about 10 months. I was on the video team there. Uh, they hired me to be a director and to, to, to shoot some stuff. So this is a commercial project we did. I directed this, um, and came up with the whole concept and, uh, yeah, it was, it was a cool shoot. We had like real actors. We had, um, you know, a crew and everything. This is my good friend, Ben Worley, who is Seth Worley's brother. Uh, he's also a great actor. Um, he was in the show, and uh, you know it was a lot of fun to to make this. Um, wasn't a great job for me. I didn't really enjoy it. it didn't didn't do well with my um, kind of authority issues. Um, so that that didn't last long. But anyways, all that to say, my filmmaking career and journey was long. I mean, it was like ten years of weddings, documentaries, freelance stuff. So I definitely know what it's like to be in the trenches, uh, just pining for work. Uh, I highly recommend getting involved in any Facebook groups that you can find. Uh, I don't know if, I guess, Discord groups now or uh, Reddit or whatever. Just finding a community in your local area uh, of of people doing what you're doing. Not only to like be friends with those people and and have like-minded friends who you can kind of share your struggles with, but also for work. I mean, even though you might meet another DP person and you're a DP or you're an editor and you meet another editor. That doesn't mean that that person may not give you a job because they might be overworked one day and have too many things coming their way. And if you're kind and and you stand out and you, you're a professional person, they might, you know, pass that job off to you. So anyways, so that kind of goes, uh, to my first, um, foray into YouTube. Um, after I quit my job at Dave Ramsey, I didn't know what to do. I kind of went back to weddings, um, for a a time and, and did that to pay bills. But while I was kind of doing that, I started doing YouTube and then I got an offer from this Chinese company called Kinotika to host their channel. 
this was a huge deal. Uh, I was desperate to like not do weddings and not do anything that I didn't want to do. And I loved YouTube. I fell in love with it. And the things that I loved about magic and the things that I loved about video were, were combined with YouTube. I was able to be a performer. I was able to exercise the skills that I developed as a performer and as an entertainer and blend that with my skills as a filmmaker and videographer and uh, an editor. So it seemed like the perfect kind of marriage. And I loved, uh, I loved gear, camera gear. So I started working with Kinotika. Um, pretty soon I realized I needed some help. Um, they were wanting me to do two videos a week at the time. And uh, <clears throat> I asked if I could get some help, hire somebody. And they said, yeah, sure, just find somebody. And uh, Connor, who is a family friend of mine, uh, was like in college at the time. I think he was about to graduate. And uh, he started working with me and, you know, it was very early. He was a teenager. Um, was he? No, he was 20. He was 20, I think. Anyways, man, it was a wild ride. Kinotika was so much fun. We started from scratch. We started posting two days uh, two days a week. Uh, I think it was Tuesday, Thursday. And I would basically just buy every camera that came out, review it, and post a video. And then move on to the next thing. Um, I was so excited. Like, it was such a fun kind of motivating, exciting time because I just couldn't believe that somebody was paying me to do YouTube videos. And those first videos, you know, for the first couple months, like only got a couple hundred views, um, a couple thousand if I was lucky. Um, I was really involved in community on uh, on uh, EOS HD forum, on different forums as well, just trying to reach out and uh, and, and make friends and Went to NAB, got to meet uh, Caleb Pike for the first time and a couple other YouTubers as well. And the next day I knew that the Blackmagic camera was coming out, the Blackmagic 4K. This is NAB 2018. I knew it was coming out from the rumors. I understood YouTube enough to know that if we're first, we win in terms of the views, at least at this time. Breaking the news was a big deal. And... Believe it or not, just in 2018, camera companies weren't sending cameras to people as often as they are now. Um, so uh, Connor and I like got up early. We we stood in line at NAB until the doors opened, and I knew where the booth was. Uh, so we we stayed in that line. Obviously, we were first in the door. We ran to the booth. I picked up the camera, shot a bunch of B-roll with it, asked the employees a bunch of questions. Uh, Within about five to 10 minutes of doing that, getting our B-roll and and just holding it and asking questions, I then shot a video. Here, I'll play it now. I shot myself reading all the specs, which all the specs were already kind of rumored anyways the night before. Um, So I kind of already knew the specs, but I just confirmed that with the employees. Shot the video. I edited it and we uploaded it within two hours of when the the show floor opened. So I think the show floor opened at 10. We got up around noon. I posted it on all the forums. I posted it on Twitter. Um, I sent it to a couple like news article companies uh, and it got picked up uh, by all those, a lot of those, uh, are, you know, websites and the forums and, and, we were the first people to do this. Uh, it sounds crazy now, but I mean, now there'd be five, six YouTubers over there already, uh, and they'd be doing the same thing probably. But it was really exciting time, like 2018. It sounds crazy. It wasn't that long ago, but it was for this type of content. It really was uh, pretty new um, for our particular niche. Video went viral. You know, to us, it went viral. Got a hundred thousand views in a day. Uh, we only had 2,000 subs, I think, and uh, the channel was was still so fresh. I mean, we were lucky to get a thousand, if like I said. So to get a hundred thousand views uh, was really awesome and really just juiced us up to like just keep going. And so we just made a bunch more videos on it, and uh, you know getting to meet all the YouTubers and they saw the success that the video had and they're like, ah, nice job on the thing. You know, it was cool to like 
be a part of that community. You know, it was like I it, that was kind of my entering into the gear community, if you will. Um, and the channel continued to to grow and whatnot. Around that time, my wife and I were were kind of thinking about moving to California. Uh, it was just a personal goal goal for us to get out there eventually. And um, because of this video and a couple others, Polar Pro saw those videos and they reached out to me and uh, asked if I'd be interested in hosting their podcast which was based in California, Costa Mesa, uh, Costa Mesa, the Polar Pro podcast. And um, sure enough, you know, the Golden Hour podcast, which you're listening to right now, uh, started back then, 2018. The first episode ever was with Chris Poplowski. Um, this was our kind of makeshift set that we designed. Um, this video didn't go out until I think like later in the year, if not uh, the, this says February 2019, but um, it was shot in the summer of 2018, I believe. We moved to California. Connor moved as well. Because he wanted, he wanted to move. He, he had nothing like holding him back. Um, and it was, you know, my job. I was providing work for him and he, he came. Um, and the, the channel continued to grow as well. And we had another viral hit that uh, kind of Christmas time with the DJI Osmo Pocket review. Um, we got early access to the camera. And, um, I think a lot of other YouTubers probably got early access as well, but again, we're talking 2018. This is November, 2018. It was a different time back then. And, um, people kind of took their time with things. And I think a lot of YouTubers didn't think that this camera was very good. And I didn't either, but I didn't care. I was too hungry to like care. I just wanted to get something out. So we went to LA and we went to the place where all the murals are. Um, I forget that area. So yeah, um, this video got again, a couple hundred thousand views. There's another one we did on it as well, comparing it to the GoPro that we posted on the same day. They both did very well. Um, and after that, 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 that video kind of became, um, a bit of a, like, Oh, you guys did the Osmo pocket video. I also skipped over the M50 video. We did we did an M50 video before we moved um, to California. And has it hit a million yet? No, it's still not there yet. So yeah, before we moved to California, like a couple months prior, um, we did a we did a whole slew of Canon M50 videos. Uh, Caleb Pike told me he's like, man, you guys won't rest on those M50 videos. But hey, it uh, it works, right? Um, yeah, it's got nine hundred and eighty three thousand seven hundred sixteen views, which is very close to a million. It'll probably hit it at some point this year. Um, even though the camera's so old now. So we were the M50 guy. We were the Black Magic guys. We were the uh, we were the Osmo Pocket, and then uh, what we did the um, the Sharp 8K camera as well at CES. And that's what I miss, man. I miss going to these conferences because you would see these like this random camera, this 8K camera at CES 2019. Uh, you know, it never came out. It was just a prototype. It was stupid. Um, but we saw it, we shot it, we uploaded it, boom, there's another viral hit, you know? A couple hundred thousand views pretty quick. And uh, it was so fun to just go out and hang out with other YouTubers. And, like, this was such a dream for me to not work with clients. Ah, oh, gosh, clients. Ah. Uh, just working with anybody that is not creative, like, it drives you up the wall. Like... I think this is something that you guys can relate to, hopefully. Being creative is a bit of a blessing and a curse, right? Like, at the end of the day, it would be so cool if all of the artists out there just kind of got money each month. Basically, like, it would be so cool if our needs were met, you know, and money just came in. And the artists were allowed to just be artists and just make whatever we want 
and and those projects were fully funded like i mean obviously of course that part uh would be tricky um but in like in a dream world for me personally if i never had to even think about finances i would just make whatever i wanted and like i almost feel like that's what i'm made to do is just make stuff make art not you know make something that i don't know it's weird cuz we sell our art in a way and then we shift it to be specifically for a client you know for their purpose so it's bad you can't wrap your art into client work that's kind of at the end of the day you can't like you have to kind of have an outlet for your art otherwise you're going to get so disappointed cuz you could end up working with a client and you think like, oh, they, they actually love my ideas. I'm going to go all out and spend like, I'll pull an all nighter and, you know, spend my own money on this thing. And then they're like, okay, that's great. But can you change this? I'm like, well, that's the thing that took me all night. <laughs> it's like at the end of the day, they're, they're right. Right. I'm going to eat a, I'm going to eat a, a candy corn. By the way, sue me. Candy corn can be eaten at any time of year. I love candy corn. I wish it didn't have the uh, the orange dye. I feel like the the color is probably bad for me to eat. I know orange dye is bad, but it just I just I love the texture. I think some people hate the texture, and I love the flavor. It's got a honey flavor to it, which is fantastic. Anyways. That's kind of my Kinetika journey. Um, like I was saying, I really wanted to get into doing you know, things I, I like doing. <laughs> like I just went on this little rant here. And I, the camera stuff was great, but it was definitely becoming uh, a job, which is fine. Uh, it was still a job I loved. But reviewing cameras every single day. Uh, d- believe it or not, it d- does get a little tiring. Uh, you know, even though I'm somebody that could probably talk about cameras all day, that being said, I wanted to do something different and just have fun. And so I came up with these, uh, parody videos and the first one I came up with actually was gear guy, um, from, it was a parody of, of, uh, Billy Eilish's bad guy called, uh, gear guy. <clears throat> but Around that time, um, the new iPhone was coming out, the iPhone 11 Pro at the time, it was 2019, and uh, so I switched gears and took the Old Town Road song and did a, an iPhone song. Uh, we, we don't have to listen to the whole thing, but I do want to play some of it. I'm very proud of it. Um, as a diehard Apple fanboy, I find the, the lyrics to be yeah, pretty pretty good. Uh, if you are a fan, you might get some of these inside jokes. My dad produced it. He, he did the auto tune as well on my voice. So it doesn't, you know, I'm not a good singer. I'm not a good singer at all, but I did write this song rather quickly. Um, my wife actually came up with the punchline of the song, which you'll, you'll hear in a second. Um, but it was my first time doing that and ah, man, it like, it pushed all the buttons that I like have been training for all my life as a creative full on performer, you know, all that magic experience, just being as crazy as possible as, you know, trying to be as entertaining as possible, understanding how to perform to camera. Uh, the cinematography, obviously, you know, of the, the music video shoot itself, like understanding the structure of music videos from shooting multiple music videos over the years and directing them. Uh, and then the writing, I didn't even know that was a, like a talent that I had. I never written anything before, but you know, when you're given a, a melody to begin with by doing a parody, it's pretty easy to just write funny things around the melody. Um, I was so blessed and fortunate to have, uh, I Justine and Sarah Dietschy featured in this video. Um, I'll kind of tell the story how that happened at the end here but let's just play the chorus here um i did go to cupertino um to film some of this stuff i went to the apple campus i went to the google campus um 
And yeah, so let's let's take a watch. I'm gonna stand in line till my feet are sore. I want the brand new iPhone. I'd do anything. I would sell my soul for that phone with no headphone hole. I got the AirPods and a Mac. Dongles in my pack, aluminium attack, college space gray, not like black, all maxed out, of course. Ha! Steve Jobs wouldn't do So that is actually my real uncle. Um, if you're listening to the audio, this is my um, a guy that looks like Steve Jobs. Ah, oh, excuse me. Candy corn getting stuck to the top of my mouth. Ah! Uh, yeah, this is my real uncle, my dad's brother. Um, he happens to look a lot like Steve Jobs. And once you, uh, dress him up with the turtleneck and the glasses, he, for a split second, does look like him. If you, if you put an image next to him, not so much. Uh, but I did another video with him on my personal channel here where, uh, I took him around, uh, the mall and, uh, people like got autographs and, we're taking pictures with him and stuff outside the Apple store. It was really funny. So yeah, my uncle happens to look like Steve Jobs. And, uh, you know, he happens to live in California as well. So he just came over, put the suit on, and he's in the video as Steve Jobs, which is hysterical to me. Made up in the valley. Cupertino, California. Yeah. Google can't sell me nothing. They can't sell me nothing. I don't trust them with nothing. Gmail is the exception. Gotta have There's I Justine right there. Adapters. Triple lens back cameras. Face ID and touch ID. Siri worked your sad. Miss Sarah. Actually, she doesn't work. Last week I asked for movies. Instead, she gave me links to things like canopies and toiletries. Siri understands me often, but not very often. I still won't switch for nothing. I'm inside this walled garden. Yeah, I'm gonna stand in line till my feet are sore. I need the brand new iPhone. I do anything. I would sell my soul. Anyways, you get the idea. Um. You can watch the whole thing if you want on the uh, in the link below. I had a total blast making this thing. Uh, the story is uh, the iPhone launch was happening in September, and um, you know this is when people would actually go to the Apple campus and go to the keynotes and everything. And they had keynotes; it wasn't just a video. And I knew Sarah and Justine would be there. Uh, I was not invited. They were. I was not. Um, but I. I didn't say that I wasn't invited, um, but I just kind of said like, hey, uh, I'm doing this parody. I would love for you guys to be in the video. Uh, I'm going to be in Cupertino when you're there. Uh, will you be in it? And they both were super kind and super generous with their time. And Sarah in particular, like really went out of her way. Um, I ended up having to, it didn't work out with Justine. I mean, give me a break. She, it's I just seen in the Apple campus. Of course, she didn't have the time. She's like, that's like her home. That's like her, that's like her home base. Um, and Sarah really carved out a lot of time for me, which was just so generous of her. And, um, but I, I actually just drove up there uh, to do it. I knew that like shooting at the campus would be special. I got to see the Apple campus. The The frame that I've frozen on here is the old Apple campus. And then uh, I shot a lot of it in front of the kind of main Apple store in Cupertino. And then I got that cool Google sign at the Google campus. Um, but all the stuff I shot with Sarah was at Cupertino. Um, and then we ended up shooting uh, the bit with Justine uh, in Santa Monica, which was again, just super kind of both of them to, you know, spend their time on it. I so loved making this. Um, and that moved on to gear guy, uh, which like I said, is a parody of Billy Eilish, bad guy. If you haven't you heard, suck. Oop, that was random. <laughs> you suck. Anyways, uh, you might notice somebody here at the beginning. Uh, this is actually Zach Mayfield who came out from Tennessee to f shoot this with me. Gold ring, now red, my 
I feel like a lot of people don't get that. Um, that thing, gold ring, now red, my Canon lens. If you're not a Canon person, I, you know, I understand if you don't know it. Basically, the gold lenses are like the prosumer lenses. And then the red ring lenses are like the top of the line L series. You know, lenses like the G Master for Sony. Um or I guess the Leica for like a Panasonic. But anyways, uh, that's that part. 5D, it's not actually 5D that I'm holding. It's my 1DC, which is sitting on the table here. Turned you in, now it's mirrorless. I'm up with all the trends. Think I'm original. Can men no Sony? Yes, from G. I don't have creativity, but I have lots of... So I'm a gear guy, collect a lot of stuff guy Don't know how to use guy, pretend I think I know guy I'm the camera type, don't know how to shoot type Gotta use my gimbal type, only shoot 10-bit type I'm a gear guy Sub Let me <laughs> Let me go to my favorite part here at the end I love this part So, special thanks to Zach, uh, to Jake, who helped me shoot this. Uh, I gave them credit in the description. And uh, Ruslan, uh, Adnar Love, I'm so sorry, Ruslan, if you're watching this. He's an amazing producer. Uh, he's in a multiple bands um, and, and produces uh, amazing stuff here in Nashville. He actually, from scratch, made that entire uh, track. He played all the instruments. He made it a little different so that the copyright uh, system wouldn't flag it, um, even though they did a little, you know, but whatever. Um, and then he made me sound fairly good uh, with the autotune and stuff. Um, so I did another one that's not as good, um, but it was during COVID when all the <laughs> when all the uh, late night hosts were like filming stuff on their phones. It was basically like. It was basically making fun of the fact that they don't know how to shoot anything. So I was like giving them tips on how to how to shoot. I'll just go to the chorus. Cause the lighting's really bad. Sad, but at least you got a cause and self new window. There it is. Feeling like it's a lost cause. Cause it's not. Just place yourself near windows to help fill in all those wrinkles. Make your iPhone really stable. Place it over your eye level. So anyways, it's based on a Chainsmokers song. I don't like that one as much. Um, I have reposted all these videos on my personal channel, Dave Mays. Um, I'm going to be doing some stuff on this channel soon um, that I can talk about here at the end, but... Uh, these were originally on Kinotika. I asked Zach if he could uh, privatize them because um, I wanted to just let them live on my channel. They weren't. I did them when I was working with Kinotika, and I, I did post some of them on Kinotika. Um, and so the views are, are, you know, definitely higher there. Um, but they they didn't perform as well as just like top ten things you should know about the Panasonic. You know, whatever. Excuse me. And uh, so th that was a little, like, a little depressing. But the thing that made it even more depressing uh, is uh, I got, uh, right after that third and final uh, parody that I did, I got robbed. Um, I was trying to sell something on OfferUp, and they came to my house, and uh, they... You know, they were they seemed legit and everything and they ended up just taking the the drone that I was selling and they just ran. And, you know, I called the cops and stuff and 
you know, they took down information and whatever. And I thought that was kind of it. But two weeks later, they came back. And when my wife and kids were out of the house, they broke in, they took everything. And uh, it was really violating and uh, seeing just all your camera bags and things just open on the floor, just completely rummaged through. Uh, I if you saw the gear guy video, you saw all the cameras I had at the time. I had like seven or eight cameras, way too many, to be honest. Now that I've been through this, I try to keep things to a minimum uh, so that if you are to get robbed, they're not going to take too much because you don't have much. But anyways, that was super depressing. And uh, we ended up just having to move. And the whole gear guy video was shot in that apartment. Um, you can kind of see some of the like greenery and things at the apartment and the beach that you saw in the video. Uh, that was like five minutes from my house. And if you look at the a lot of those intro videos, there's some cool beach stuff. And a lot of the videos that I was shooting, there was a ton of beach stuff. We lived in Laguna, uh, Niguel, which is like one of the most beautiful places I think in the world. I've been to a lot of places. I've been to the Bahamas and, and even, you know, Hawaii and stuff. And like, man, that was like paradise. We loved it there. And I say we, um, Connor lived in the same apartment complex and we converted his living room into the Chianti cassette. And then I lived a couple houses down or apartments down with my wife and, and son um, I now have two boys, but at the time I only had one and, uh, it was so cool to just like wake up in the morning and just walk over to Connor's house and shoot videos, took it for granted, man. We did not realize how good we had it. That was such an amazing and fun time, uh, to be doing that. And, uh, you know, watching these videos brings back some of those memories and, uh, you know, I miss it. And the robbery really ruined that. The getting robbed and all that. Like we just didn't feel safe there anymore. They knew where we lived. You know, they came back, they stalked us. They waited for us to leave and then they broke in. So I felt like it was definitely the right move to, to move. Um, and we kind of just quickly picked a spot, you know, and it was nice, but, uh, not as nice as where we were. And I felt like that period of time was really sad for me. I, I really kind of had to grieve for that time. It was also right when COVID hit. So I think everybody was grieving. It was just a crazy, crazy time, uh, last year. And, uh, what's really cool about my story, you know, with the whole, the whole YouTube thing is that there was this little angel that, uh, came down at, from heaven and <laughs> from the YouTube, uh, from the YouTube God land, uh, his name is Ted Sim. He's the president of Aperture and uh, host of Indie Mogul and and president, you know, director of Indie Mogul. He called me up and said, "Hey, Dave, what are you doing?" I was like, "Nothing. I'm just living in this random condo that we went to because I got robbed and I had to move." He's like, "God, oh, dude, that sucks. I saw. I'm so sorry." He actually, he actually reached out, sent me an email when it happened. And I said, if I ever need anything to let him know, it's just such a kind person, <clears throat> but he's like, we're looking for a host, we're looking for somebody to do gear stuff on Indie Mogul. And you're the first person we thought of. And we'd love to begin a conversation about getting you on board, being, being a host on Indie Mogul. And man, what a mind blowing moment for me. Um, I was enjoying Kinetika. I had a lot of, you know, pride in, and I was very proud of what I achieved with Kinetika and I was hoping to continue that, but, um, it was a bit in a rut, uh, mostly because of COVID and the robbery. And this seemed like a great change and obviously a great opportunity. If you aren't familiar with Indie Mogul, I have mentioned it multiple times in our podcasts. It's one of the, uh, kind of OG filmmaker channels. It's been around since like 2007, I think, or 2008. Uh, it's been around for a long time. And they've got 1.29 million subscribers. It's exchanged ownership hands a couple of times. Um, I think at one point Google actually owned the channel, which is interesting. Um, and there's been, a, there's been multiple hosts as well. 
but the legacy of the brand, the legacy of the channel is, is amazing. Uh, and it was, uh, I mean, I'm just gonna be honest. It was a dream come true to be able to, uh, have an opportunity like this. I mean, come on, give me a break. I was, uh, working at Dave Ramsey even before that, just shooting weddings and stuff. I've always been so blessed though. Like I've been able to do uh, magic and then, you know, the staff pick and all that. I, it's been really strange how over the years, I, I feel just so blessed. Um, I love meeting people. I love connecting with people. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's the connections that I've been able to build. And maybe that's something that's natural to me. Uh, and I would highly recommend you to do that, to, to connect with with people. Um, that really, not for the sole reason to to further your career. Um, just be genuine, be kind, and be a servant to other people. Um, maybe that's it. I don't know. Um, I've worked my butt off for a long time though. Um, but I'm definitely, I feel like any, there's so many other YouTubers that could have done this as well. And the, and, and the fact that Ted offered this to me was just so humbling. And, you know, he and I are very uh, friendly still. And, um, I think our personalities lined up really well. Um, and so the couple of times that we met, you know, we really hit it off. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I think they offered the job. So, yeah, um, on August 14th, uh, my 30th birthday, we announced uh, that I was joining the team. The channel of Indie Mogul, which we are pumped about, we're super excited about because you guys have been asking for a lot of gear related content for a long time. And I'm going to be honest. Um, I am like the worst person in the world <laughs> to talk about anything. Who is out someone out there that is doing awesome gear related content that could benefit and should be on a platform like this? And first person that came to mind, Dave. So because Potato Jet wasn't available. Because Potato Jet wasn't available. I called him like six times Yeah, and he hung up on us. <laughs> uh, Dave, real quick, uh, tell us a little bit. Of so... Anyways, that was my kind of introduction to Indie Mogul. Ted and the whole team there, Tway, Matt, Jake, and Ted. Uh, those were the guys on the Indie Mogul team. And then um, the whole Aperture team was also there. The, the Deity team, Deity, whatever you want to call them, they were there too. And I was driving from Orange County to LA, which if you if you know uh, like California, Southern California, you know how uh, brutal that is. But it was like an hour and a half each way. So I was driving three hours a day um, just to go to work. And so at a certain point, I was like, we can't do this. And so um, we ended up landing in Pasadena. And out of all the cities and all the places we looked at, it's the place that my wife and I felt was the best for, for our family and our situation. It was close to Glendale, which is where this was. And... Uh, I mean, I was freaking the host of Indie Mogul in Hollywood, uh, a channel with over a million subs, making a good paycheck, uh, working with a bunch of guys that were amazing. I mean, give me a break. It was it was a it was a complete, unbelievable situation. It really was. It it really 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 was. And um, you know, to be honest, I I would be lying if I told you I don't uh, miss it you know I haven't done it in six months I haven't been on YouTube in six months really um, I think the last video that we posted was in February uh, on Indie Mogul and that was my last like gear review um, thankfully I have this podcast and thankfully Polar Pro has continued uh, our, our relationship when I told him I was moving back to Tennessee um uh, Polar Pro was just amazing with this show, and they were like, "Yeah, let's let's keep going." Yeah, you know, I was already doing it remote when COVID hit, so uh, definitely go over to Polar Pro Filters if you ever need filters. They've been so generous to me, and and uh, by by them allowing me to continue the show, um, we've been able to have so many great guests on, and hopefully in the future the show will continue to grow, um, and you guys can contribute. I would love to have you guys be more a part of it, but I'm going on a tangent there with that, with that segment. But, um, yeah, we did some amazing videos. Uh, I was only there for five months, 
But some of my favorite videos are my first my, my first video, uh, the Komodo. A lot of people made fun of the way I said red Komodo. I think I kind of I kind of said it like kimono. This is the red Komodo. Yeah, I mean it does sound. Like, this is the red Komodo. This is the red Komodo. The 6K resolution for $6,000 red camera with global shutter and red raw recording. So yeah, that was uh, that was the first one, and then um, we did a couple others and. Uh, you know, one of my favorite ones was the Sony A7S III versus, versus the Alexa Mini LF. The Sony A7S III has finally arrived. After many years of anticipation, it has finally come. Full frame 4K at up to 120 frames per second, all 10-bit internal recording with IBIS, flip screen, incredible new battery system, new advanced color science, and crazy high ISO performance. But is it the perfect camera? Eh, maybe for some people. But for all of us, it's really just another tool. So we've decided to compare the A7S III with some of the top Hollywood production cinema cameras on the market. So one of the things that came with working with Indie Mogul that I never experienced before is the, the, the kind of like the name uh indie mogul in hollywood especially it just had such a familiarity like people knew what it was so we had some connections with rental houses and we'd say hey we, we need to use a venice and an alexa for a for an indie mogul video and they'd be like okay <laughs> okay sure you can just have it for a day or just sign this you know waiver how much is it? Oh, you, you can have it. Just, you know, if you want to mention us in the video or whatever. And it was like, oh, okay. Um, don't have that anymore. <laughs> so anyways, um, that was cool. It sucked that I was there during COVID though. LA during COVID was not fun. Uh, the rules were crazy and as an anti-authority person it drove me crazy and then we uh, you know uh, i'll sh share my my very last kind of favorite video was the uh iphone 12 pro max versus seventy thousand dollar cinema camera challenge featuring i justine and armando fiera i took the new iphone 12 pro max which came out around that time period and put it head to head with uh the alexa with uh sony uh, or no, the C70 um, and uh, the S5. And we kind of did like a competition thing uh, with iJustine and Armando, which was a ton of fun. Two of our favorite creators on the platform, iJustine and Armando Fiera, to come into the studio and do a head-to-head. -head. So I like, I put on the left or the right, you know, I, I, would, I would switch it up. So like either on the left or the right is the iPhone and you have to kind of guess which one's the iPhone. And I would, I would play like silly disadvantages on them that, that you know they'd have to like put an orange filter on the monitor for one round and uh one time i blasted a 120d in their face while they were looking at it or whatever um it was a ton of fun and i really enjoyed it and this was kind of like this is what i'm talking about like this is the type of content that i want to make on youtube is like entertaining stuff not just gear uh videos all the time like, I love gear. I love tech. I love talking about those things. But I feel like there's so much more that we can do with it. And that's what I've been... That's kind of been my constant struggle or, like, challenge with with being a gear guy on YouTube. Is, like, that kind of... The entertaining side. Like, you look at Top Gear, you look at, you know, Kai W, who we had on the show recently. Like, there's such a, a skew towards entertainment. But even Kai kind of said in our conversation, like, yeah, like, it seems like we're not, we're being more serious now. Um, so, anyways, I wasn't... Um, no matter where I go, I am there also. 
<laughs> basically what that's saying is like I was dealing with some marriage stuff um, I wasn't really seeing my kids as much as I wanted to and that was on me I was working too much and the and Ted didn't didn't ask that of me um, in fact he told me to go home a lot and I would stay late uh, work on videos and stuff <clears throat> <clears throat> and now that I've had some hindsight and some time, some distance from it, I realized that my identity was wrapped up in what I did way too much. It was way too important to me to be a YouTuber and way not important enough to be a good father and a good husband. And so I was kind of realizing that. And then also, um, Ted didn't agree with, uh, with me on the entertainment stuff. Uh, and so, and to be honest, like I was already feeling kind of like I've been doing gear stuff for like four years now, three, four years, whatever. Uh, I'm kind of ready to try something else. I'm ready to try something that's just entertainment. If you look at like commentary channels, entertainment channels, I mean, the numbers are astronomically higher than gear review channels. Um, but is it all about the numbers? No, it's not. I mean, you can make a good living doing gear review channel, uh, gear, uh, gear review content and getting a t 10,000 views and having a hundred thousand, 200,000 subs. And you can make a living probably off of that. But I want to, I probably want to make a video on this specifically at some point, this topic, this idea, but I just want to say it here if you're listening and you're maybe hearing my story and, and can relate to it. And maybe you want to be a YouTuber as well, similar to what I was doing. If you're a videographer and you have or a filmmaker, I know you guys hate the word videographer, but if you have video skills and you see YouTubers on YouTube, making a living, doing YouTube stuff, specifically gear stuff. And you think to yourself, huh, I could do that. Unless you really, 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 really love gear. And that is everything that you want to do. And you're very happy with the idea of not necessarily like kind of hitting a ceiling a little bit at a certain point. Then go for it. Go for it for sure. But if you have the skill set to be on camera, to make entertaining content and to make videos but your first inclination is to do gear stuff because it's what you watch and you see other people doing it. I want to just encourage you to pause and then think about some other things in your life that may be hobbies or things that do bring you joy. Uh, for me right now, it's like Tetris, believe it or not. I've been getting into classic Tetris or um, movies. I love movies. I love talking about movies. I love talking about shows, um, silly old 90s stuff, nostalgic, n nostalgic things. I love reminiscing, thinking about things from the 90s. I love guitar. Um, I would urge you to consider doing something in a different niche than filmmaking and gear stuff. And you can go to Caleb Pike, you can go to Gerald and Dunn, you can go to Jevin, you can, you can watch all these guys that, that you already watch and learn and be a part of that community and whatnot. But I would argue that you probably have better success in these other niches that have way less videographers in them. Because I have found with my experience doing this now that the bar is set so ridiculously high in this camera filmmaker niche thing that it's almost like a waste of time to spend all day on the lighting and, and audio when it when you can make more money and have more success doing entertainment stuff and have way less production value and crank out more videos and bring in more eyeballs and, and take over other niches that don't have halfway decent quality. Like you can get away with halfway decent quality on another niche that's not a filmmaker or photography niche like you, you may have the ability to play with the big boys and girls uh, in the tech and, and camera space. 
but it's slow. I mean, it's a slow process. You have to have a crew. You have to have a lot of lights, you know, a studio, whatever. And if those things don't bother you, then by all means do it. If you love those things, then by all means do it. But like, remember what I said about David Dobrik and the other YouTubers like Mr. Beast, even Mr. Beast always has good audio though. I have noticed that he actually does have audio guys, but the way that they shoot is really rough and dirty. It's always clean. Like it, you know, it's lit and the camera's in focus, but it's not shot on cinema cameras. Like it's not compositionally gorgeous every time. Um, it's intentional. They do that intentionally. David Dobrik uses an ADD still. He's like a multimillionaire. He shoots on an ADD with a built-in mic. He doesn't even use a mic on his camera. That's intentional. It feels authentic. It feels intentionally amateur. All that to say. If you're interested in something else, like I would consider, I, I would highly recommend that you think about starting a channel around another interest that you have. Even if you're a professional videographer, if you're a professional filmmaker and you know how to use cameras inside and out and you watch Gerald Undyne and you watch Josh Yeo and you think, oh, I want to do that. Do it. Go ahead. If you really want to go for it. Um, but that's been my struggle. I, I know I've like established myself as that guy. So and I know all the people that, that follow me on Twitter and, and Instagram uh, know me as that guy, but I'm kind of tired of being that guy, to be honest. And I'm frustrated with that uh, that the YouTube game in that niche. The idea that I every product that I get, I have to like make a video under an NDA and you post a video about a new Sony, whatever. And it's, it's up there with 20 other YouTubers and you know, it's just a weird, it wasn't like that in 2018, you know, when I started, maybe I'm just an old craggly, uh, YouTuber. All that to say, I got an offer to work with my cousins, um, who I love dearly. Uh, Amy is my actual cousin, her, her husband, Jordan. Um, they moved to Nashville and, um, they have a very successful photography, uh, education business and they needed a video guy and, uh, they offered me a job to move back to Tennessee and to be their video guy. And I said, Oh, I don't have a camera really. I, I have like a, this Olympus camera, you know? All my cameras got stolen. Uh, no. Also, when I was at Indie Mogul, I, I did sell things. Um, I didn't need cameras. They they provided them. So they're like, it's fine. Just tell us what you want and we'll get it. And I was like, well, I mean, to be honest, I would love a C70. I think that's the best tool for what we're doing. We're doing long form content. I'm going to be, you know, needing to monitor uh, audio and I want to have good built in audio and Indie and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, Fine, you know, stop talking. Well, it's already ordered. You know, why are you trying to sell us on something that we already bought? You know, I'm like, oh, great. I'm just joking. They didn't say that. Um, you know, we recently just built out their set. Uh, I was very pleased with that. It's been kind of fun, like being behind the camera. Um, I haven't, I haven't done that in a long time. We built the set out. We had a 120D as the 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 key light, and then some quasars to fill everything in. I think it came out really nice and it was kind of like that in a way that was fulfilling for me too in a, in a, a different way to see the lighting and, and they were just overjoyed with how it looked and the image on the C70 is wonderful. Um, and I'm editing these videos and I'm having fun editing the courses. Uh, I'm making them basically as entertaining as I possibly can, uh, making them like a YouTube video. They're just two hour long YouTube videos. Um, but I'm still missing th this, this part where I talk and uh, get to perform. And you can't have everything in life. I mean, it's been, there's been pluses and negatives to moving back home. Um, probably, I, w I was about to say more pluses than negatives, but I don't think so. I think it's kind of equal. Like I said earlier, 
no matter where I go, I'm there also. So a lot of the issues that I have, um, that I had in California, I also have here. I'm no different. Uh, we moved across the country to a completely different area, um, than we were in. And we loved California. I loved it. My wife loved it too. We love the beach. We love the access to just everything. I mean, it's like a... If you don't live in America, you know. You know Hollywood, LA. Like, it's... It's like a... It's paradise. It really is. It, it is. I mean... Yes. The governor's crazy. <laughs> Yes, there's a ton of people, and yes, there's a lot of traffic, and yes, things are expensive. All that being said, it, in my opinion, it balances it out with the amazing opportunities that are there, the amazing people that are there. Because there's so many people, there are great people, because there's so many of them. <laughs> Uh, And in particular, we really loved living in Orange County, and specifically in Laguna, where we lived first. And I, you know, I look back on some of these videos, and it's uh, it's a weird kind of reminiscent uh, thing to do. It wasn't that long ago that we were there. It was, you know, less than a year ago, six months ago, we were there. And about a year ago, we were in Laguna. And it's uh, it's a little painful, honestly, because I. it was gr- it was a great time and I miss it. It's nice being here um, near family. For way less money, we're able to rent a house with five bedrooms. As ridiculous as that sounds, it's something that uh, has been a wonderful uh, blessing because I'm able to use this room as my little podcast room, and then on the other side of this camera is my desk set up with my computer. Each kid has their own room. We have a room and then a guest room. Uh, we've been having a lot of guests coming in and out now, which has been really cool. And But my wife and I are just finding that all those things that I just listed, the house, uh, you know, the crazy things in California, those things don't matter. And if you're listening to this and you're in a weird situation as well you're feeling a little down a little depressed um just look around like friends family spouses children those things those people are what matter and uh no matter where we go i say we in my case my wife and children We could literally live on a houseboat in the middle of Montana, you know. Do they have lakes out in Montana? I don't know. I'm sure they do. It doesn't even matter. We could live in a we could live in a a hotel room with two beds. And we're still at the end of the day gonna be the same people. And you know, that's home is the people that you love. So no matter where you live, um, Just make sure that you stay true to your home. And, uh, you know, coming home, in my case, is being with my family. And so, getting a little choked up. Um, So, yeah, moving, leaving Indie Mogul, moving here, um, was a decision that I felt like was the right decision for my family. And it has been. We've, you know, our marriage has gotten better. Um. My relationship with the kids has gotten better. Uh, I'm near my parents who help us each week uh, with the kids. The kids are able to have a close relationship with my grand- with my parents, their, their grandparents. Uh, we live near my cousins who I work for and they have kids. So we're able to all kind of interact together. But um, it's just one of those like you got to die to yourself kind of things. For me, you know, I'm kind of sharing the the overarching things, but like when I get kind of uh, selfish about the whole thing, like I was the host of Indie Mogul in Hollywood. 
that was pretty cool. <laughs> um, timing wasn't right. I, uh, I got kids. I got a wife. It, w- it wasn't right. If it was like seven years ago when we were newlyweds or, uh, yeah, and we didn't have kids yet would have been perfect. Also seven years ago was a different time. Um, So here we are. Uh, I'm in Tennessee. I'm working with my cousins doing courses. And I do uh, the podcast every week. I've been coming up with some new ideas of what I actually want to do for fun. And what my goals are for YouTube personally. And um, I do have a strong family kind of sense about things and I would love for my family to be involved so I may do that um I may also just try to do something solo and do something really wacky and out there and crazy um so be on the lookout um I'll be sharing my journey through that and I'm talking as though this is the end or something but uh it's not I'm just it's the end of this podcast <laughs> Um, yeah, that got like way more deep than I was expecting. And, you know, if it was too deep for you guys, I apologize. Um, but I'll show you what, why I, uh, the real reason I moved back to Tennessee is for these guys. This is my son, Ryan and, uh, Caleb. So this is why I move back to Tennessee. It's for these boys and my wife, beautiful wife, Laura. And she's with the two boys there. So yeah, this is my world right now and uh, I'm grateful for it. So <clears throat> you can't have everything. And uh, as I get older, it's just something I'm continuing to work on and learn and as a creative you kind of just have these crazy highs and lows and you get burned out and get emotional about things (laughs) at least I do and uh you know you just gotta take life as it comes at you keep moving forward never stop take breaks rest certain periods I feel like I'm in a rest period I've been go, go, go nonstop with YouTube stuff for the last three years now, and it has been a wild ride. Um, and I think I needed some time away from it. So these last like five months have really been a bit of a healing thing personally for me. And who knows, maybe I'll, um, maybe I'll do gear stuff again. Uh, You know, I still felt in my gut there was something there with some of these concepts, um, but just didn't work out. So anyways, uh, this is the new format of the show. <laughs> hopefully you guys enjoyed it and hopefully you learned a little something about myself. And, uh, yeah, see you next week. Once again, I'm your host, Dave Mays. This is the Golden Hour Podcast brought to you by the Port Pro Studio, and we'll see you.